So, good day to all of you. So, we're already finished with Chapter 1, Introduction of Operating Systems. Now, we are on Chapter 2, Operating System Structures. So, I hope that you are now ready to learn something new about CPT-221 Operating Systems. So, let's start Chapter 2. So, the contents of Chapter 2, Operating System Structures are Operating System Services, user and operating system interface, system calls, system services, linkers and loaders, why applications are operating system specific, operating system design and implementation, operating system structure, building and booting an operating system, operating system debugging. And the objectives of Chapter 2 are identify services provided by an operating system, Illustrate how system calls are used to provide operating system services. Compare and contrast monolithic, layered, microkernel, modular, and hybrid strategies for designing operating systems. Illustrate the process for booting an operating system. Apply tools for monitoring operating system performance. And last but not the least, design and implement kernel modules for interacting with the Linux kernel. So first is we have operating system services. So, operating systems provide an environment for execution of programs and services to programs and users. One set of operating system services provides functions that are helpful to the user. So, first is we have the user interface. Almost all operating systems have a user interface or UI. So, UI varies between command line interpreter or CLI, graphics user interface or GUI or GUI, Touchscreen, if your device permits or has that feature. And then we also have batch interface. So a batch interface is a method for giving commands to a computer in which commands are entered into files and the files are executed without any human interaction. So next is we have program execution. So the system must be able to load a program into memory and to run that program and execution either normally or abnormally. So, for uh, program execution, so it will be loaded into memory and then it ends, uh, it ends execution. It's either, it's either as it's indicated normally or unfortunately may be abnormally and it will indicate an error. Next is we have I.O. operations. A running program may require I.O. which may involve a file or an I.O. device. So, continuation with the operating system services that are helpful to the user. So, also we have file system manipulation. The file system is of particular interest. Programs need to read and write files and directories, create and delete them, search them, list file information, and permission management. So, another service is we have communications. Processes may exchange information on the same computer or between computers over a network. Uh, communications may be via shared memory or through message passing or packets moved by the OS. Uh, another service is the error detection. So OS needs to be constantly aware of possible errors. May occur in the CPU and memory hardware, in I.O. devices, or in user program. So for each type of error that will occur, OS should take the appropriate action to ensure correct and consistent computing. And then uh, it also has debugging facilities that can greatly enhance the users and programmers' abilities to efficiently use the system. So there is also another set of OS functions exist for ensuring the efficient operation of the system itself via resource sharing. We have resource allocation. When multiple users or multiple jobs running concurrently, resources must be allocated to each of them. As we already discussed in Chapter 1, so these are the types of resources such as CPU cycles, main memory, file storage, and I.O. devices. So next is we have logging to keep track of which users use how much and what kinds of computer resources. And then we also discuss protection and security in Chapter 1. So the owners of information stored in a multi-user or network computer system may want to control use of that information. Concurrent processes should not interfere with each other. So for protection, it involves ensuring that all access to system resources is controlled. 
So, if you're a guest, you can only view files, but then you cannot uninstall uh, software in that computer system. And then, security of the system from outsiders requires user authentication, extends to defending external I.O. devices from invalid access attempts. So, security is more of the concern of uh, for viruses, malware, and, uh, and other, um, for example, denial of, of service attacks. So that's the concern for of security. So we have a diagram of a view of an operating system of operating system services. So we have the user and other system programs. So the uh, OS. So its part is we have the user interfaces and system call and services. So the user um, is interacting with the GUI. If it it is if if the system has a graphical user interface. If it has a touch screen, if the device has the, that capability or the hardware, and then we have the command line interpreter. So these are the types of user interfaces that an OS can offer the user. And then we also have system calls. And these system calls are used to use the following services of the OS, such as program execution, I.O. operations, file systems, communication, resource allocation, accounting, Error detection, protection, and security. So, underlying operating system is the hardware. So, as discussed in Chapter 1, operating system serves as the manager and the mediator between the hardware of the computer system and, of course, the user of the computer system. So, as we are already discussing uh, the user interfaces, so the first uh, user operating system interface that we're going to discuss is all about the CLI or the command line interpreter. It allows direct command entry, sometimes implemented in kernel, sometimes by systems program, sometimes multiple flavors implemented. These are called shells. Actually, in Windows, we have this Windows PowerShell. And then primary fetches a command from user and executes it. And sometimes commands built in, sometimes just names of programs. If the latter, adding new features doesn't require shell modification. So this is an example of a command line interpreter, a born shell command interpreter. So aside from Windows PowerShell, does Windows has another command, command line interpreter? Actually, there is. We have the command, command prompt. A uh, command prompt... Um, it resembles the old, the old um, operating system of Microsoft, which is MS DOS, Microsoft Disk Operating System. Um, the Windows PowerShell is a newer version of a CLI because it has a newer uh, naming conventions and formats with regards to commands. Um, I'll show you the command prompt in which um, um, it is really a command line interpreter just like this one. So, of course, it uses a different set of, uh, of uh, commands for you to, to navigate or to execute a file or open or for their directories and others. So, let's open the command prompt here in Windows. So, we have command prompt. Okay. Okay, let's wait. Okay, so we have this uh, command line interpreter. This is an example. Actually, so if you are familiar with MS-DOS and you're still familiar with the commands, I think you can navigate. But if you're, if you're a person born um, uh, uh, and is used to graphical user interface and you don't know the commands, it will be very difficult for you to navigate um, this um, this command line interpreter. So we have this so-called prompt. So C colon backslash users backslash Shirohana, Shirohana means you're in drive C and you're inside the folder of users and users has another folder nested or another folder inside which is Shirohana. Okay. So that's the default for a command prompt if you're going to open. So, what if I want to go to a particular drive? So, if I want to go to a particular drive, you must know what are the existing drives in the computer system. So, we have drive C, 
this is the system uh, in which all the the windows and the program files are installed here so let's have f okay if the prompt here appears after you um typed f colon meaning the drive here is existing or it is mounted in the computer system so how are you going to know the contents of this drive so for those who are born with the graphical user interface you're just going to click the drive and you already can see the contents of the drive but here it's different so we're going to type the command dir meaning directory so slash w for um for wide so that uh, uh you will display the 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 items not in uh not in new line so to save space and then we have slash p for pause meaning if you have too many files in a drive and it's not fitted in the in the whole screen there is a command press any key to continue to see the contents okay so let's see what's the contents of drive f okay so it's very uh, very many files i'm not uh, i'm not yet organizing these files yet so a sort uh, a variety of files and then as we can see okay so you can see the the text with uh, brackets open and close brackets meaning it is a folder while those uh, text that doesn't have a pair of brackets it means that it is a file okay so press any key again to continue okay continue because it has many files in the folder okay so this is uh, at the end of this directory it summarizes how many files that you have and how many directories and what is the how much uh, bytes does this uh, whole files occupy and then it also calculates how many bytes are still free okay what if i want to go inside a folder would you click it in here no because command prompt as i've said it resembles the uh, early um, operating system of uh, ms uh, of microsoft which is ms dos in which all that you're going to do here is you're going to type so that's why it's it's called command line interpreter um though there this there is a cursor for the mouse but then it will not work because again this is a cli so for example i want to go to this folder usb space drive so what will i what will i do so we have cd cd means change directory space okay the name usb okay actually it's not case sensitive usb drive as long as it's correct spelling okay so what happened cd change directory space the name of the folder so what happens is that you are already inside the usb space drive folder so again how are we going to know the contents of the usb drive folder so we can type dir slash w slash p or since you've already type written the command you can press the r up arrow key okay so you select the uh, command that you've typed earlier on so dir slash w slash p okay as you can see in our uh, the inside of the usb drive folder it contains also folders okay next what if I want to create an additional folder inside USB drive? So we have this command md make directory. For example, I want to name the folder hello. Okay, there is no message that the directory or the folder hello is successfully created. Okay, there is no notification unlike um, the notifications that we are seeing in other programs. So, how do we know if your operation is successful? So, to know again the contents is you have to type dir slash w slash p, then enter. Okay, from the previous um uh, from the previous command of dir slash w slash p, there is no hello folder, but uh, on the next 
execution of the IR, there is already a hello folder. So, I want to go inside the hello folder. So, cd hello. Okay. So, you're already inside the folder of hello. Okay. Next, what if I want to exit this folder? So, to exit this folder, what you're going to do, but before, first before that, uh, I have this another command for cd or change directory, cd point. Okay, what does this do? So, if you can notice, nothing happens because cd point meaning, point means that uh, it, it, it points to the current directory. So, that's why nothing changes. What if I uh, type again cd? Then, two points. CD point point. Okay. What does CD point point do? So, CD point point means that if you execute this command, you're going to exit to, uh, from the current folder. So, it means you're already outside the hello folder and you are already inside the USB drive folder. Okay. Again, let's enter this hello folder. Okay. What if I want to go to the root folder? This is the root folder. C, D, the, these are called root folders. Without going outside of hello, then going outside of USB drive directly to the root directory. What if you have very many nested folders? So, the easiest way to do that is CD backslash. CD backslash. So, you see... You are already in the root directory F drive. Okay. This is useful if you have many nested um, folders and you want to go directly back to the root directory. So, again, um, let's enter again the folder C, uh, USB drive, CD, USB drive. And then, okay. What if I want to delete? Hello folder. Okay, there's also a command for that. We have rd, meaning remove directory. Okay, remove directory only works if the folder that you're going to erase is empty. But if it's not empty, rd will not work. Okay, so um, you're go. But what what are you going to do? Is you you have to delete. You're going to inside the folder and then delete its contents by using delete del, and then go uh, go back. Uh, go outside the folder and rd hello. So that's the the way of erasing uh, uh, an a uh, non empty folder. Okay, rd hello. So let's check. Uh, there again, there is no notification that is really hello folder uh, erased or removed. Okay, let's see again. Okay, dir slash w slash p. Okay, you can see there is already no hello folder. So these are the basic uh, navigations for uh, for the command line interpreter. So can we? Okay, since we are already or already inside the command line interpreter, can we? Um, open a Windows program inside. So, let's see. So, we're in drive F, meaning it's not the drive where the software are installed. So, you have to go to drive C. Okay. So, automatically, you're, you're directed to this folder because a uh, Windows folder of is, is a... Uh, it's a system folder. If you really don't know what you're doing and you modified something, um, it may have a, um, a bad effect on your computer. It may have an error. So, you have to be careful. So, for, for this demonstration, so let's go to the root of this uh, prompt, which is drive C, CD backslash. And then, again, to know the contents of this drive. Okay, so we have... Okay, we have the folders here of Windows and Program Files. So, let's go with, let's go inside Program Files. So, CD, Program Files. And I want to see the contents of this folder. 
Okay, so we have this installation. But again, why is it? It looks like it's very few because some of the installed uh, software are in program files x86. These are 32-bit, while program files here are 64-bit. Okay. Okay, what if I want to open the software for Notepad++? Okay. Uh, again, you have to change directory, Notepad++. Okay, we have, again, know the contents of this folder. Okay, so what are we going to execute or run uh, for a uh, file? Okay, files that uh, that are executable are uh, this ends in .exe. Okay, so we, we can see here, this is the notepad plus plus .exe. Um, for example, if you have the icon and you double click the icon of this software, it means that you're opening the .exe file. Of course, it's a graphical user interface, but here, what you, are you going to do to run the Notepad++ is, do we need to click? No, of course, because uh, mouse click here is not working, so you have to type notepad++.exe and see what will happen okay there's no success okay but as you can see uh, by typing the name of the of the file and then that exe it will open the software notepad all of the files ending with exe if you're going to open it in the cli it will open okay another well another way to open is uh you can also type notepad plus plus but without the exe because it understood that even though it has does not have an executable that exe extension it means that it is an executable file or exe file so let's try without the exe if if it has the same uh, um, effect or is, is it going to open or not okay let's see okay so the both of them with exe or, or without exe, it will open as long as the file is an executable file. Okay. So, how are we going to exit? Of course, we have this uh, close button, but um, in a uh, what if you don't have a close button? So, the only way to get uh, 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 to get outside aside from again uh, uh, exiting from this program aside from the close is we have to type exit so you are already uh, the command prompt is already closed so that is the um, navigation of command line interpreter actually you are very lucky because you were born that graphical user interface is already invented because when i was learning that um ms dos and those commands i have to memorize it because the commands because if you will not memorize it you ha you are in no way can navigate the uh disk operating system and at the same time is it only the navigation no you can format you can format there you can uh, copy you can delete but then of course i only demonstrated the basics because of course i don't want to have problems for example if i accidentally deleted or formatted my, the, the whole drive so that is for a demonstration of a command line interpreter or cli okay so next so another user interface is the graphical user interface or the gui so user friendly desktop metaphor interface so it uses usually a mouse keyboard and monitor so icons represent files programs actions and others so various mouse buttons over objects in the interface cause various actions such as provide information options execute function open directory or known as a folder so in CLI that is called directory, but now because of GUI, it's now called a folder. So it is invented at Xerox Park, and then many systems now include both CLI and GUI interfaces. So Microsoft Windows is GUI with CLI command shell, the Windows PowerShell, 
And then Apple Mac OS X is Aqua GUI interface with Unix kernel underneath and shells available. And then for Unix and Linux, we have CLI with optional GUI interfaces. We have CDE, KDE, and GNOME. Okay, another one is this is very prevalent in our smartphones and devices. So we have touchscreen interfaces. So touchscreen devices require new interfaces. Mouse not possible or not desired because we are using actions and selections based on gestures. And then virtual keyboard for text entry and touchscreen interfaces has voice commands such as, for example, your Google Assistant by Google. So instead of typing, you can um, dictate what you want to search. Okay, this is an example of a Mac OS X GUI. So, of course, it has a different look and feel. But then they also have these folders. So, um, maybe a little diff diff different interface with Windows 10. Okay, next is we have system calls. Programming interface to the services provided by the OS. As I've already discussed, the system calls uh, in Chapter 1. Typically written in a high-level language, C or C++. Then mostly accessed by programs via a high-level application programming interface or API rather than direct system call use. So three most common APIs are the Win32 API for Windows. POSIX API for POSIX-based systems, including virtually all versions of Unix, Linux, and Mac OS X, and Java API for the Java Virtual Machine or JVM. So note that the system call names used throughout this text are generic. So we have an example here. So system call sequence to copy the contents of one file to another. So from source file to destination file. So for our experience to copy contents of one file to another, we're going to open the source file. Um, in a GUI, we're going to highlight the text, right click, copy, and then we're going to create a destination file or the new file. You're going to create a new file and then inside that file is right click and then paste and you already have the contents of the file so that's an example if in GUI but here in the system call sequence in a uh, command line interface we have or interpreter first is you have to acquire the file name write prompt to screen and then accept input and then next is acquire output file name write prompt to screen and accept input then open the input file if file doesn't exist, abort. Of course, you cannot copy if there is no source file. And then create output file. So for this condition, if the file exists, also abort. Um, this system call wants that the output file must be created on that uh, execution of the system call. And then we have the loop while read from input file, route, write to output file, and then until read fails or nothing to be copied. Then close output file, write completion message to screen, and terminate normally. So actually, our for us users, it's just what we're seeing is, for example, copying and then paste. But on the background, this is what really happens. But uh, for this uh, for these six lines, these are intended for command line interpreter. Okay, next is we have an example of standard API. So as an example of a standard API, consider the read function that is available in Unix and Linux system. The API for this function is obtained from the man page by invoking the command man read on the command line. A description of this API appears below. So to use this um to use this is we have to include a uni std.h and then s size underscore t is the return value. Then function name is read. And then we have parameters. We have int fd, void buff, which is a pointer, size underscore t count. So a program that uses the read function must include the unistdh.h header file. As this file defines the s size underscore t and size underscore t data types, among other things. The parameters passed to read are as follows. So we have int fd the file descriptor to be read, then void buff, 
and then we have uh, asterisk a buffer into which the data will be read so i as i've said uh, with an asterisk it is a pointer and then we have size underscore t count the maximum number of bytes to be read into the buffer so on a successful read the number of bytes read is returned a return value of zero indicates end of file if an error occurs read returns negative one so next is we have system call implementation. So typically, a number associated with each system call. So system call interface maintains a table index according to these numbers. So the system call interface invokes the intended system call in OS kernel and returns status of the system call and, and any return values. The caller need know nothing about how the system call is implemented. It just needs to obey API and understand what OS will do as a result call. So most details of OS interface hidden from programmer by API. So it is managed by runtime support library, a set of functions built into libraries included with compiler. So we have an example of API, system call OS relationship. For example, user application. Again, I want to open the program Microsoft Word. So what will I do? If you can see the icon on the desktop, what will you do? You're just going to double click it. Double clicking it will invoke the open. So the open system call and then it will have it will go to the system call interface. Since the user wants to open the program Microsoft Word, so what will happen? So this command from the user no, uh, mode it will go to the kernel mode and then the table for system call um, interface. And then we have the open implementation of open system call. And then it will going to fetch the program that it, that is to be opened, which is Microsoft Word. And then after fetching it, then it will respond to the user application that Microsoft is already loaded or uh, open and loaded in memory. So that is the an example of the uh, diagram for the API system call OS relationship. So next is we also have the system call parameter passing. Often, more information is required than simply identity of desired system call. Exact type and amount of information vary according to OS and call. So three general methods used to pass parameters to the OS. So first is the simplest. Pass the parameters in registers. In some cases, maybe more parameters than registers. Next is we have parameters stored in a block or table in memory and address block passed as a parameter in a register. So this approach is taken by Linux and Solaris. Another is parameters are placed or pushed onto the stack by the program and popped off the stack by the operating system. So for this one, we have a stack. So the operations for stack is push and pop. Push meaning you're going to put values into the stack. Pop means you're going to remove the value on, on uh, in the stack. Okay, what's the interesting here with stack is that it is a LIFO. LIFO means last in, first out. So if you're... If you're going to put the data, uh, the last data, it will be the first one to be removed. So what, I, what is an example, a real world example of a stack? Example, you are in a restaurant and then you need a tray and then there's a stack of tray. So if it's a LIFO, where are you going to get the tray? Is it at the uh, uh, bottom part of the stack or on the... Uh, on the topmost. Of course, you're going to get the tray on the topmost. But if you can notice, if someone will put a the tray back into the stack, will the person be struggling to put the stack at uh, the tray on the bottom uh, at the bottom, or uh, he or she will return it at the top? So that is the meaning of the last in, first out. So what you put on the stack at the uh, uh, topmost, it will be the first one to be removed. Okay, so I'm going to discuss this um, in a separate um, video uh, about the stack operations. So how are we going to put data and at the same time, 
how are we going to remove data is by means of popping. Okay, that's the the term. Okay, um, I don't know if if I, I'm I don't know if uh you're already familiar with the commercial of of this a uh, very uh popular potato chip snack. So I I, I I'm going to say uh I, Pringles. So Pringles has this uh tagline or a motto or uh in the commercial. So once you pop, you can stop. So because why? Because Pringles, as you can see. Uh, the, the, the potato chips inside are in a stack. Are you going to struggle to, uh, to, to get the potato chips at the bottom? Of course not. You're going to get the chips at the top most. So that's why the term of pop. Maybe the one who thought of Pringles' um, line for that advertisement is related to computer or IT that knows the stack operations. Okay, because the term is once you pop, you can't stop. Okay. So again, I'm going to provide an additional video for the stack operations and how it is done. So block and stack methods do not limit the number or length of parameters being passed. So parameter passing via table. So we have the user program. So X are the para uh, are and then we have the X is the uh, data and then we have parameters for call. So the user program will load will load address X to the register, and then there is a system call number thirteen. So it will um uh, contact with the operating system and use parameters from table X. And then this will be the code for system call number 13. So that is the parameter passing via table. Okay, next is we have types of system call. Actually, there are so many uh, uh, types of system call. So first type is we have process control. So for process control, we have create process, terminate process, end or abort, load, execute, Get process attributes, set process attributes, wait for time, wait event, signal event, allocate and free memory, dump memory if error, debug, debugger for determining bugs, single step execution, locks for managing access to shared data between processes. So for file management is we have create file, delete file, open, close file, read, write, reposition, get and set file attributes. For device management, we have request device. Release device, read, write, reposition, get device attributes, set device attributes, logically attach or detach devices. So for information maintenance, get time or date, set time or date, get system data, set system data, get and set process, file or device attributes. And then for communications, since we have create, delete communication connection, send, receive messages, if message passing model to host name or process name or from client to server. And then we also have shared memory model, create and gain access to memory regions, transfer status information, attach and detach remote devices. And then for protection is we have control access to resources, get and set permissions, allow and deny user access so system call has many types and has many categories and you can already see for all of the operations there is a corresponding system call for that okay we have a, a table here of examples of windows and unix system calls are they the same or different so the following illustrates various equivalent system calls for windows and unix operating system so for process control so for Windows, it's create process. For Unix, it's called fork. Exit process for Windows. For Unix, it's exit. Waiting for single object. And then for Unix, it's wait. For file management, for Windows, it's create file. For Unix, it's open. So read file for Windows. So for Unix, it's read. Then write file, write. Close handle, close. And then for device management, for Windows, Set console mode, then for Unix IOCTL, read console, it's also read, just the same with file management, and then write console is write, so it's also the same with file management write. And then for information maintenance, get current process ID, so get PID, 
for Unix, set timer, alarm, sleep, sleep also, but with Windows, it's capital S. For communications, we have create pipe and then pipe. For create file mapping, we have shm underscore open. For map view of file, we have mmap. Then for protection, for Windows, set file security, ch mode for Unix. Initialize security descriptor, we have umask for Unix. Set security descriptor group for Unix is ch own. Okay, uh, what can you say about the system calls of Windows and Unix? For Windows, um, based on the na naming convention of the system call, it is more descriptive than Unix. It's uh, by, by means of the name, you can already get the meaning or what system, uh, what does this system call is doing. Okay, next is we have a standard C library example. So C program invoking printf. So if, if you're not familiar with printf, meaning um, the, the text that is indicated inside the printf function will be printed or displayed on screen. So, this printf library call uh, calls write system call. So, the standard C library provides a portion of the system call interface for many versions of Unix and Linux. As an example, let's assume a C program invokes the printf statement. The C library intercepts this call and invokes the necessary system call or calls in the operating system. So, in this instance, the write system call. The C library takes the value returned by write and passes it back to the user program. So if you're a programmer, so you're going to write the program. So uh, printf is included in stdio.h or standard input output.h for C. And then this is int main, the main body of the C program. And then uh, in this line, we have printf, then uh, open and close, double quotes, greetings. So what does this command do? So in user mode, the programmer or the user is coding the program. If this is uh, being executed, so from the kernel mode, so the equivalent for printf for the standard library is in kernel mode is write, then write system call, and then it will return to the standard C library and then to the uh, printf. So if the user executes it, the write function is it will display the text on the screen which is the text is greetings okay so we have the example for arduino example of uh, uh with a with devices with an operating system so arduino is single tasking as you can remember um, you can only upload one program at a time so that's why it's a single tasking so for this one there is no operating system actually so we're just going to study the the contents of how does the arduino um, um structure is done and then programs are sketched loaded via usb into flash memory so by means of the uh, of the ide connected to the computer you can transfer your sketches in the memory and then single memory space and then bootloader loads program, and then program exit is shell reloaded. So for letter A at system startup, uh, this happens if, for example, your Arduino is brand new because it only contains bootloader and free memory, or this will happen if you're going to reset the, if you're going to push the reset button of Arduino, meaning you will going, uh, you're going to erase the stored program sketch uh, binary uh, inside the memory of the Arduino. So if you're running a program, so we have, again, the bootloader is already reserved. And then th this is the user program or the sketch. And then if, of course, uh, uh, program or the sketches, Arduino sketches are very small. And then there's free memory. But then as I've said, even though the sketches of Arduino are small, um, it will not load many programs at a time, but it, it will only load, uh, it will only accept one program at a time. And if you if you really want to have that program again, it will only overwrite the existing uh, sketch that is copied um, prior to the second uh, Arduino sketch. Okay, for FreeBSD. So FreeBSD is a Unix variant. It is multitasking. 
So for user login, invoke user's choice of shell. And then shell executes fork system call. As you can remember, fork means create a process. And then executes exec to load program into process. And then shell waits for process to terminate or continues with user commands. And process exits with code zero. There is no error. If code is greater than zero, then there's an error code. So this is the um, memory setup. So we have the kernel and then we have uh, processes here and then there's also an interpreter and if free mem if there is still a free memory inside of course of your uh, memory okay next is we have system services so system programs provide a convenient environment for program development and execution they can be divided into file manipulation status information sometimes stored in a file program language support, program loading and execution, communications, background services, and application programs. So most users' view of the operating system is defined by system programs, not the actual system calls. So um, some of them are also uh, simply user interfaces to system calls. Others are considerably more complex. So next is we have file management. So create, delete, copy, rename, print, dump, list, and generally manipulate files and directories. So for status information, so some ask the, the system for information such as date, time, amount of available memory, disk space, number of users, and then others provide detailed performance, logging and debugging information. So typically, these programs format and print the output to the terminal or other output devices. And then some systems implement a registry used to store and retrieve configuration information. Actually, Windows has this registry editor. So again, I can show you uh, how it's done, but you have to be careful because uh, uh, it is very crucial because if you're going to change your registry, uh, without even thinking or if you don't know what you're doing, it may damage your operating system. So I'm just for the sake of, uh, of your in, uh, for information. So the name here for Windows is Reg Edit Registry Editor. So let's click Registry Editor. Okay, so yes. Okay, so again, warning. Um tweak or modify it at your own risk because if you do not know what you're doing then um you may uh you may leave your operating system not non-functional okay so what is the use of registry editor one of the usage is for example um there are some programs that even you uninstall them it will not in uninstall their folders so by means of registry editor you can look for that particular uninstalled software and delete the other the folders that are still uh, that are still inside the registry but then again um you have to know what what you are doing so another use of registry editor it's just i uh, uh, that's why i'm i'm familiar with this because when when i have an old computer which is running in windows 7 um i i i found in the internet that you can change the login wallpaper uh, the login wallpaper default for windows 7 is the blue one so when i saw a video then it has the uh the, the user's favorite wallpaper so i researched on how it is done because it's just a wallpaper it will not harm the whole system so when i knew when i read the direction on how to do it so i tested it on my windows 7 and, and i replaced the default wallpaper with for, uh, my favorite um, anime character so where actually it was successfully done so i was really very happy when logging in because i can see the wallpaper of my favorite uh, anime character so i really don't know if it will work in uh, here in windows 10 but definitely in windows 7 it will work so uh, what i did is uh, i went to this uh, registry editor it's just for fun okay but I, i'm not a person who will uh, explore because Again, registry editor is uh, very crucial 
uh, it is actually a system program. So you do not need, uh, you do not, uh, you do not customize or modify it um, if you're not really sure of what you're doing. So this is the registry editor for Windows. So okay, so it has many folders. It's not really the folders of the files, but the registry of all the installed and uninstalled software uh, in your computer system. Okay, so okay, 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 I will not going to explore it anymore. If you really want to explore it, but uh, again, use the power of the internet. I just show you that Windows has also a regist uh, registry and it also, also has a registry editor. Okay, let's go back with our presentation. Okay, we also have file modification. So, text editors to create and modify files. And then, special commands to search contents of files to or perform transformations of the text. Okay, Are, uh, do you believe that text editors can create and modify files? Okay, let's try this one. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate it again. Okay, so we have notepad. Okay, not Notepad++, but the Notepad of Windows. Okay, so you have this um, Notepad. Okay, you thought that Notepad is just a TXT, but actually you can create files out of the Notepad. So leave it blank, then we're going to save it. So, instead of saving it as .txt, okay, let's try testing.docx for Microsoft Word. Let's see if it will work. Okay, remember that I've saved it in the desktop. Okay, I've already saved it. Okay, let's exit for a while. And then again... Let's open the file explorer. Okay, so I've saved it in the desktop and it's testing that docx. Okay, let's open. If it will really open in Microsoft Word. See? You can create files out of a text editor or, for example, Notepad. But of course, it's blank. Okay, let's let's see if will it be recognized if we're going to put a content inside the Notepad. Okay, again, let's write "Hello World." Okay, "Hello World." And then, let's save it with, okay, let's over, okay, testing.docx, okay, let's save. So, since it's already existing, so we will replace it. Let's see if, will it uh, be open or is there an error? So, let's see again, let's close again notepad and then testing that docx okay okay you can see in the preview there is the text hello world but can we open it just like with a blank uh, microsoft word file okay there is a preview but windows uh, rather, Microsoft Word as a message, so Word experience an error typing, trying to open the file. Try the suggestions. Check the file permissions for the document or drive. Make sure there's sufficient free memory and this basis is impossible. So open the file with the text recovery converter. So though you can see it uh, in the preview, but then uh, because there is a problem, of course, it's a notepad and the encoding of text is different from Microsoft Word, so it has an error. So... Aside from, is it really only document files that it, it, it can produce? Okay, let's test another one from Notepad. Okay. 
Okay, from notepad, again. Okay, leave it blank. It will work if the, the file does not have anything, on uh, any text from, any uh, text inside. So, let's save. So, you want to produce a PowerPoint presentation. So, testing that PPT X. Okay, we're going to save it again in the desktop. So, let's save. Okay, so let's close. So, where's the testing.pptx? Okay, so let's open. Will it open? Okay, let's try. Okay, so it will create also any types of file as long as it is it is black. There's no text inside the notepad uh, for, for the, uh, so that there will be no error. So, any file uh, can be created by notepad as long as it is a blank file. Okay, so this is already a demo that proves that text editors can create files. Actually, in uh, in older Windows, um, I'm using also text editors. For example, there are um, unrecognizable file, and you know that it is a picture file. So what will be, I'll be doing to the text editor is I'm going to open it in the text editor and change the file name by putting, um, uh, for example, it's uh, there is no extension. So, okay, let's dem demonstrate it again so that you will understand what I'm saying. So, again, we have notepad. Okay, for example, example, I've opened an unrecognizable file. Then what I'm going to do in an older version of Windows is, for example, I know that it is a picture file. It is a JPEG file. It, it is just... um. Um, renamed without the file name extension. So, for example, I have testing. So, to, to change the, the the file is I will put it in a double quote testing that JPG. So, so that the unrecognizable file will be a JPEG and it works. So, but now I am not going to test it here because um, Windows 10 has already the feature, for example, that um, you can add the file name extension while renaming the file. So, that's already a plus for Windows 10. For older versions, this is what I've been doing. Again, for unrecognizable files, and then I'm going to convert it into a, if you really know that it's a picture file, so then I'm going to put it again, the file name in uh, into double quotes. Okay, so, again, let's return. So, next is we have... Programming language support. Compilers, assemblers, debuggers, and interpreters sometimes provided. So most of the IDEs, depending on the programming language, they may be compiler, assembler, debuggers, interpreters, or they're all in one um, in the IDE. So program loading and execution, absolute loaders, relocatable loaders, linkage editors, and overlay loaders, debugging systems for higher level and machine language. Next is for communications. Provide a mechanism for creating virtual connections among processes, users, and computer systems. So allow users to send messages to one another's screens, browse web pages, send electronic mail messages, log in remotely, transfer files from one machine to another. So, for background services is, we have, uh, these background services are launched at boot time, some for system startup, then terminate, and then some from system boot to shutdown. Okay, those background services are only available for system startup, and then after they have uh, already initiated, they're, go they're going to terminate, or there are background processes or back uh, background services that is um, all throughout that the PC is on, it is also uh, working in the background. Okay, it provides facilities like this checking, process scheduling, error, logging, and printing. So, run in user context, not in kernel context, known as services. 
subsystems or daemons. So for background services, okay, uh, this is the this is uh, uh, located in the uh, task manager of Windows. So again, let's return. Okay. Okay, right click the task uh, the task bar. We have task manager. Let's load the processes. Okay, so this is the active apps. Of course, I'm recording this video, uh, this presentation, and then, of course, the PowerPoint presentation, and then the task manager and the Windows Explorer. Then we have this background processes. Again, um, do this at your own risk because, for example, uh, especially for background processes such as this, um, if, you're, if you really are very knowledgeable about this, it's fine. But for example, uh, for for background processes, actually in all processes, there is an end task. But if you end this without knowing what will happen, so stop. So actually, background processes, leave it be. Okay? Um, task manager, uh, for this purpose, it is only used, for example, my Microsoft PowerPoint suddenly has, uh, it's not responding. Even I I uh, I click the close or the exit uh, button, it will not exit. So meaning it cannot release the resources. So from task manager, you have to click it and then end task. Then from this task manager, they can uh, really um, unload, for example, a program that is not responding. Okay, this is forced. Uh, 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 for forcefully ending a task that has uh, that is not responding anymore. So, but then again, use this only for application programs and not for background processes because these background processes are maintained and monitored and managed by the operating system itself. Okay, let's return again to our presentation. So, application programs don't pertain to system because these are third-party software that is installed by the user. And it's also run by the users, of course, uh, based on their usage. And then, not typically considered part of the OS, again, as I've said, because uh, most of the application programs are, are, third, are provided by third-party vendors. And then, it can be launched by a command line, as I've said. Uh, you can execute an application program or run an application program using a command line interpreter, mouse click for uh, using a mouse, or finger poke if you have a touch screen interface. Okay, next is we have linkers and loaders. So, source code compiled into object files designed to be loaded into any physical allocation. These are called the relocatable object file. So, linker combines this into single binary executable file and it also brings in libraries. So, the program resides on secondary storage as binary executable, must be brought into memory by loader to be executed, and then relocation assigns final addresses to program parts and adjusts code and data in program to match those addresses. So, for modern general purpose systems, don't leak libraries into executables. Rather, they use dynamically linked libraries or in Windows, the DLLs. These are loaded as needed, shared by all that use the same version of that same library, which is loaded once. Uh, example of a program that uses dynamic link libraries is the Microsoft Office Suite. Why? Because if you're going to open Microsoft Word, we have this interface as file, edit, um, view. If you're also going to open... Microsoft PowerPoint, they also use the same menu. So those same menu, this is uh, this is that's what they call the dynamically linked libraries. And then also object executable files have standard formats. So operating system knows how to load and start them. So this is the illustration or a uh, how does the role of the linker and load uh, loader is illustrated in this diagram for example we have a source program which is a c program main.c and then you're going to compile main.c by using a compiler so the compiler is gcc and then 
uh, minus C and then main dot C. So if you're going to compile it, it will generate an object file. So the name of the object file is main dot O. So for other programming languages, sometimes it's dot OBJ. So after compiling, it will uh, produce an object file. And then this object file will be brought to the linker with the other object files. And then this linker will link this, uh, this object file and other object files. And it will generate an executable file, which is called main or main.exe. And then this loader, of course, uh, this will load the executable file to the memory. And then in program in memory, there are dynamically linked libraries. So the role of the linker, of course, is um, compile. Uh, it's it's like integrating the object file and other object files into one. And then the loader, of course, is the one who loads the executable file into memory. Okay. Next is why applications are operating system specific. So apps compiled on one system usually not executable on other operating systems. That's true because, for example. You have an application in Mac OS, and this application uh, that that natively runs on Mac OS will not run natively on Windows because of uh, the compilation. So each operating system provides its own unique system call. So that's the reason why applications are operating system specific because Windows has their own set of system call as well as Mac OS has their own system call. So that's why you cannot run programs from Mac OS to Windows or vice versa. So they have their own formats, as I've said. And then apps can be multi-operating system. So what, uh, what are those apps? These are written in interpreted language like Python, Ruby, and interpreter available on multiple operating systems. There are also uh, apps that are multi-operating systems. So again, they're written in interpreted languages. Or another app written in language that includes a VM containing the running app like Java. So because Java is not platform specific. And then you have use standard language like C, compile separately on each operating system to run each. And then we have application binary interface or ABI. It is an architecture equivalent of API, defines how different components of binary code can interface for a given operating system on a given architecture, CPU, and others. Okay, next is we have operating system design and implementation. So design and implementation of OS is not solvable because actually, um, Operating systems are 100% functional, but they are not 100% perfect. But some approaches have proven successful. So internal structure of different operating systems can vary widely. So start the design by defining goals and specifications. But it is affected by choice of hardware and type of system. So what is the difference between user goals and system goals? So for user goals, Operating system should be convenient to use, easy to learn, reliable, safe, and fast. So because that's the only concern of users, that it's very convenient. I don't have any problems with using this operating system. Uh, even though I am a new computer user, I find the operating system easy to learn. Of course, it's reliable. It does not crash. It is safe, especially when connected to the network or internet. And of course, it is fast. Once you click, it should respond fa very fast based on the, on the commands of the user. And then we also have system goals. Operating system should be easy to design, implement, and maintain, as well as flexible, reliable, error-free, and efficient. They have the same with reliable. But, of course, system goals is more of uh, the programmer side. Okay, so important principle to separate. So we have policy. So policy is what will be done. What are the rules and regulations? So mechanisms, how to do it, how to implement those rules and regulations. So mechanisms determine how to do something. Policies decide what will be done. 
So the separation of policy from mechanism is a very important principle. It allows maximum flexibility if policy decisions are to be changed later. For example, for a timer. So specifying and designing an OS is a highly creative task of software engineering. So for us, uh, for you, for you students, what is important is you know the uh, principles of how an operating system works and how does it behave or how does it uh, operates uh, when a, an issue or a problem or, for example, scheduling algorithm for page replacement. So that's important to us. For But for specifying and designing, it is the duty of a software engineer. So next is we have implementation. So there are much variation for the implementation of of operating systems. So early OSS is in, are in assembly language. So if I am going to be asked, assembly language is one of the most difficult because um, um, it's more difficult than Turbo C because it uses mnemonics. Um, you can res uh, research what is an assembly language, but the uh, but the advantage of assembly language is that you can create a program so small because you are directly um, accessing the registers. So next is we have then system programming languages like Algol, TL1, and now we have C and C++. And then next is actually usually a mix of languages. So lower levels in assembly, main body in C, system programs in C, C++, scripting languages like Perl, Python, and shell scripts. And then more high-level language, easier to port to other hardware. But the problem with high-level language, it's slower. If it is a low-level, such as assembly language, it is faster to implement. And then emulation can allow an OS to run on non-native hardware. I've already demonstrated to you an emulator uh, last in Chapter 1. Okay, next is we have operating system structure. So general purpose OS is a very large program. So various ways to structure one. So simple structure is MS-DOS because, as I've said, MS-DOS is Microsoft Disk Operating System because it only uses command line interpreter. And then we have more complex, which is Unix. We also have layered. It is an abstraction and microkernel by Mac with the H. So first is we have the monolithic structure, so the original Unix. So Unix is limited by hardware functionality. So the original Unix operating system had limited structuring. So the Unix OS consists of two separable parts, which are the system's programs and the kernel. So the kernel consists of everything below the system call interface and above the physical hardware. It provides the file system, CPU scheduling, memory management, and other operating system functions, a large number of functions for one level. So this diagram is the traditional Unix system structure, beyond simple but not fully layered. So we have the users. So the users are interacting uh, with the Unix system by means of shells and commands, compilers and interpreters, and system libraries. And then inside the system, uh, system call interfaces to the kernel, this is the boundary for uh, shells and commands. And boundary for the hardware is kernel interface to the hardware. This is already the kernel. And these are the services or signals terminal, handling, character I.O. system, terminal drivers, file system, swapping block I.O. system, disk and tape drivers, CPU scheduling, page replacement, demand paging, and virtual memory. And the hardware are the terminal controllers or terminals, this device controllers, disks and tapes, memory controllers, and physical memory. The typical traditional Unix system structure. Okay, next is we have the Linux system structure, monolithic plus modular design. Okay, why? Because uh, application as a G libc standard library it's one module and then it's interacting with another module which is a system call interface and then it is interacting with other with the with uh, another module which contains the file system networks tcp ip block devices cpu scheduler memory manager character devices and we have the device drivers and this block also 
interacts with the hardware. So, so that's why it's a modular design. So next is we have the layered approach. So the operating system is divided into a number of layers or levels, each built on top of lower layers. So the bottom layer is layer 0, which is the hardware, and the highest layer, which is N, depending on the number of layers, is the user interface. So with modularity, layers are selected such that each uses functions or operations and services of only lower level layers. Okay, next is we have the microkernels. So microkernels moves as much from the kernel into user space. So the Mac with an H example of microkernel is Mac OS 10 kernel, which is called Darwin, partly based on Mac with an H. Then communication takes place between user modules using message passing. So what are the benefits of uh, microkernels? Uh, easier to extend a microkernel easier to port the operating system to new architectures. So it's more reliable, less code is running in kernel mode and more secure. But if there are benefits, there are also detriments or disadvantages. So performance overhead of user space to kernel space communication. Okay, this is the microkernel system structure. So the application program, file system, and device driver, they have message passing in the kernel mode because these are in the user mode and then microkernel has inter-process communication memory management and cpu scheduling for its services and this microkernel also interacts with the hardware okay next is we have modules so many modern operating systems implement loadable kernel modules or lkms so these modules use object-oriented approach each core component is separate. Each talks to others over known interfaces. Each is loadable as needed within the kernel. So overall, similar to layers but with more flexibility. So uh, operating system with modular design are Linux and Solaris, to name a few. So next is we have hybrid systems. So most modern operating systems are actually not one pure model. So hybrid combines multiple approaches to address performance, security, and usability needs. So Linux and Solaris kernels in kernel address space, so monolithic plus modular for dynamic loading of functionality. So for Linux and Solaris kernel, so it's monolithic but modular for dynamic loading of functionality. So Windows is mostly monolithic but plus microkernel for different subsystem personalities. So Apple Mac OS hybrid layered Aqua UI plus Cocoa programming environment. So below is a kernel consisting of Mac microkernel and BSD Unix parts plus IO kit and dynamically loadable modules called kernel extensions. So these are examples of hybrid systems. So this is the structure of Mac OS and iOS structure. So the application can access directly for user experience, application frameworks, core frameworks, and kernel environment. So, but these uh, modules, they are not interacting with each other. It's the application who can access these modules. Okay, for Darwin, is we have the application... So they are also modular. So application, and then we have library interface, and then we have Mac traps and BSD POSIX system calls. And then for the Mac kernel, this includes scheduling, IPC, memory management, IO, IO kit, and KEXTs. So this is the structure for Darwin. Okay, for iOS, so iOS is the Apple mobile OS for iPhone and iPad. And then structured on Mac OS 10, but with added functionality. But it does not run OS 10 applications natively. Though, uh, as you can see, Mac OS and iOS has, has the same structure, but it still doesn't run uh, Mac OS 10's applications natively because, of course, they are different in terms of physical memory. Because, of course, uh, this is a mobile device. 
uh, its functionality is limited and of course uh, the functionality is for saving prolonging the life of the battery so also runs on different cpu architecture so ios can run from uh, arm or intel based cpu and then cocoa touch objective uh, Objective C API for developing apps for media services layer for graphics, audio, and video. So, Cocoa Touch is for the uh, the, uh, the Cocoa Touch uh, uses Objective C API if you're going to develop an app. Then again, for media services is for the graphics, audio, and video. And then the core services provides cloud computing and databases and the core operating system based on Mac OS X kernel. Okay, next is we have Android. So, this is developed by Open Handset Alliance, mostly Google. So, it is an open source. So, you can create your own version of Android if you want to and if, you're, if, you, want, if you are a very good programmer. And then, it has a similar stack to iOS. So, it is based on Linux kernel but modified. So, what are these modifications? So, provides process memory, device driver management, of course, for mobile, and adds power management. And then, runtime environment includes core set of libraries and Dalvik virtual machine. So, apps are developed in Java plus Android API. So, Java class files compiled to Java bytecode and translated to executable that runs in Dalvik virtual machine. And then libraries include frameworks for web browsers or WebKit database such as SQL Lite, and then multimedia and small libc. Okay, this is the Android architecture. So, so uh, the topmost are the application because this is where the users are interacting. And then we have the ART VM or the Android Runtime Virtual Machine. So it is a virtual machine designed for uh, Android and optimized for mobile devices with limited memory and CPU processing capabilities. And then we have the Android frameworks. And then we have the JNI. So JNI is Java Native Interface, which allows developers to bypass the virtual machine and instead write Java programs that can access specific hardware features. And then inside Bionic is we have the native libraries such as SQL Lite, Surface Manager, OpenGL, SSL, WebKit, and Media Framework. And then we also have this HAL or the abstract uh, hardware abstraction layer. So by abstracting all hardware such as the camera, GPS chip, and other sensors, HAL provides applications with a consistent view independent of specific hardware. And this is Bionic, so Bionic, Android and then Bionic, great combination. So a type of standard C library used by Android, it has a smaller memory footprint than G Live C and is more efficient on slower CPUs. And then underneath Bionic is the Linux kernel and then the hardware. So this is the Android architecture. Okay, next is we have building and booting an operating system. So operating systems generally designed to run in a class of systems with a variety of peripherals. Commonly, operating system already installed on purchased computer. Nowadays, um, uh, not, not too long ago, uh, too long ago, when you will buy a, a laptop, you have to have your own operating systems. But now, compute, uh, laptops or desktop PCs are already bundled with original uh, proprietary operating system, which is, I think, is more uh, convenient because the user will not look for, uh, for an operating system. And of course, the bundled operating system is already is uh, it is an original copy. It's not a pirated one. So you will not have problems if you're going to update your operating system. So, but can build and install some other operating systems. Even though you already have an operating system inside, you can still have another operating system depending on your purpose or your need. And if generating an operating system from scratch, so write the operating system source code. Configure the operating system for the system on which it will run. Compile the operating system. Install the operating system and boot the, op the computer in its new operating system. So this is an example of how to build and boot Linux if 
if you're interested of creating your own operating system, so download Linux source code from this uh, site and then configure kernel via make menu config. Then compile the kernel using make and then it will produce VM Linux, the kernel image. Compile kernel modules via make modules and then install kernel modules into VM Linux via make modules underscore install and install new kernel on the system via make install if you have time so that you can have your own um, Linux operating system. Okay, next is we have system boot. So when power initialized on system, execution starts at a fixed memory location. So operating system must be made available to hardware so, so hardware can start it. So how does the operating system starts it starts with a small piece of code uh, by means of a bootstrap loader or a bios stored in rom or eeprom so uh, rom is read only memory eeprom is electrically erasable programmable read only memory uh, locates the kernel loads it into memory and starts it and then sometimes two-step process where boot block at fixed location loaded by rom code which loads bootstrap loader from disk so many modern uh, modern systems replace bios so bios means basic input output system with unified extensible firmware interface or the uefi so uefi is the modern replacement for bios containing a complete boot manager so also the purpose of the UE uefi is to minimize piracy because um the uh, operating operating systems were installed by using disk but now as you can see that laptops are already are already bundled with the computer and the the user is directed as a new owner of the computer you must back up your operating system just in case because there is no installer for the operating system the only way that you can produce an installer is is to back up or develop an image for your uh, of your system so that to minimize piracy and then common bootstrap loader which is called grub allows selection of kernel from multiple disks versions kernel options so grub actually this is available for linux um, because as i've said when we were in a government project that we are training high school teachers of using um, linux based operating system so our computers need to have a Linux operating system. Of course, we cannot give up the Windows operating system because most of our work is done using Windows. But because of the demand of work for that government project, so uh, when I was working in that uh, government project, I, I made my uh, laptop in, uh, into a dual boot. Dual boot meaning I have Windows and I have a Linux system. And then to select the... To select the infer uh, the operating system that I'm going to use, there is this grab um, bootstrap loader. And then we also have kernel loads and system is then running. So after the bootstrap loader, if you've already selected the operating system that you're going to run, the kernel loads and the system will be running. Then bootloaders frequently allow various boot states such as single user mode. Okay, next is we have operating system debugging. So debugging is finding and fixing errors or bugs. This term is also prevalent in, pro in programming. It is also performance tuning. OS generate log files containing error information. Failure of an application can generate core dump file capturing memory of the process. And an operating system failure can also generate crash dump file containing kernel memory so if there is an error for the application it will generate a core dump file but if the uh, os fails or it crashes it will produce uh, what is an example of a uh, os crash the blue screen of death the bosd it uh if for example if you encounter that i hope that you'll not encounter it with your computer system it will generally generate this crash dump file and then beyond crashes, performance tuning can optimize system performance, sometimes using trace listings of activities recorded for analysis. And then we also have 
profiling is periodic sampling of instruction pointer to look for statistical trends. Okay, next is we have Kernigan's Law. So, what is Kernigan's Law all about? So, debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are by definition not smart enough to debug it. So, does that mean if you're, or you're the creator of the, the program, then you're not very intelligent because not smart enough to debug it? No, it just means that um, this Kernigan's Law, um, as I've said earlier days, that programmer is an individual task. Uh, but now, it has become a teamwork collaboration. Why? Because of this. I think this because of this law. Uh, for example, I am a senior programmer. I am the most intelligent um, programmer in the company. Then I have uh, coded, for example, a thousand lines of code because I'm very intelligent. And I coded and then I finished it. And then when I compiled it, there's an error. So if you are the sole programmer of that, you are not good as a debugger. Why? Because you're, the, you're already the one who created the 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 code you have the mindset that it's already perfect so it will be very difficult for you if you're if you're the person who's also going to debug your own um program so so uh, there is this another position of a program uh, of a, also a programmer from the programming team which is called the debugger a debugger is a separate person the programmer cannot also be the same as the debugger no it has to be a different person because uh, a debugger can easily, uh, relatively can easily locate errors than the uh, programmer, his or herself. So that's why there is a debugger. But take note uh, that it does not necessarily mean that, oh, you're just a debugger. No, if you're a debugger, you must be also very good in programming because how can you, how can you um, detect or how can you point out the errors if you don't know the syntax and semantics of that programming language. So debugging or the de uh, debugging uh, function or debugging job or a debugger, it's also a very important job because you're the one who's going to look for the error just in case the sole programmer has uh, committed an error uh, unintended. Okay, so again, uh, that's why programming is already a teamwork. A teamwork effort it's not an individual that if you're you're the one who created the code you're also going to want uh, to look for the error if there is an error but if there is no error wow very good but of course to our is human we are not perfect once there is an error it should be the job of the debugger okay next is we have performance tuning so improve performance by removing bottlenecks so, what is the term bottlenecks? So, as to, to illustrate bottlenecks, for example, uh, in a bank, we have only one cashier. And then, there is there are three queues or three lines. And then, the lines are uh, very long. So, the cashier one already experiencing bottlenecks because uh, the person for the cashier one is only one, but he or she is accommodating three lines. So, but bottlenecks... Um, uh, it will affect the performance and efficiency because one person, um, his, he or she is servicing three lines. So, of course, it will be slower. So, to remove this bottleneck is what we're going to do. Add another, add another two cashier so that they can service uh, one cashier per line. Or, or better, two cashiers and then one line. So, that will be faster. But, of course, it will require more resources. So, that is the meaning of removing bottlenecks. Because the term for bottlenecks, for example, if you see a bottle, um, the, the bottle is on the bottom. It is, um, it is wide. But, but uh, going to the opening of the bottle, it becomes slim or it becomes um, small. So, that's what you call a bottleneck. So... So the ex uh, for 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 the real world situation for for the cashier there is bottlenecks because um you are only one and then you are servicing uh three queues so that's an example of 
bottlenecks and to remove the bottlenecks add a uh, cashier to or more cashier to improve the performance so os must provide means of computing and displaying measures of system behavior so for example top program or windows task manager i've already um seen you with the uh, i've already uh, um, demonstrated you the windows task manager but again so where can you find that actually i've only shown you the processes okay so for the task manager for the background processes but for the performance you can see the cpu memory disk ethernet wi-fi and the graphics processing unit so this uh, this acts also as a monitor so the cpu uh uses um is at 46 percent of its um frequency and then the memory is um because it's 12 gig it only uses 39 percent of memory then for hard drive because i'm not accessing any files so uh it's relatively relatively small i don't have an ethernet because i'm using wi-fi so that there is the the uh uh connection here and then of course because it has a separate um graphics chipset uh, i'm not playing any game so it's only eight percent okay so that's under the performance tab of task manager okay next is we have tracing so it collects data for specific events such as steps involved in a system call invo invocation so tools include s trace trace system calls invoked by a process gdb source level debugger perf collection of linux performance tools and tcp dump collects network packets so bcc so debugging interactions between user level and kernel code nearly impossible without tool set that understands both and an instrument uh, their actions so we have bcc or the bpf bpf stands for berkeley packet filter so bcc is bpf compiler collection it is a rich toolkit providing tracing features for linux and we have the dt trace so d tra uh, d trace rather it is a facility originally developed at Sun Microsystems that dynamically adds probes to a running system, both in user processes and in the kernel, for state analysis, performance tuning, and debugging. So actually, it was used uh, previously used, but now it the they you uh, the uh, Linux use BCC. So this is we have a screenshot of a disk noob.py traces disk activity disk IO activity. And then there are also many other tracing tools. So for Linux BCC or BPF tracing tools, for every for every layer, for every uh, services, they have their own tracing tools to monitor each of the services, the device drivers, the application, the system libraries. So th uh, this is for Linux only even the cpu it has their own chasing tools okay so this is the end of chapter two so i hope that you learned something from this chapter the operating system structure so i hope that um if you have any questions so feel free to comment below and and of course if you like the video please feel free to subscribe to my channel. So um, I hope that I'll see you on the next chapter. So again, for more learnings all about operating system. So thank you very much and good day.